These are bills that are actively moving in the U.S. Congress to try to combat the problem of foreign-based websites that are basically just hubs for pirated material. In theory, there are two ways to do that. One, keep Americans from reaching them. The other, keep them from getting any money so that they have to shut down themselves. Both of these bills have provisions in them to get a court order to force a financial services provider, somebody like MasterCard or Visa or PayPal, to not give any money to the people who are associated with that site. The other mechanism is advertising networks because some of these sites obviously make money through selling advertisements. This bill would cut off that flow of money. I think an example that highlights how that works in practice is WikiLeaks. There were a lot of folks who wanted to make WikiLeaks just disappear from the internet. Well, they went after the payment networks and said, stop processing payments to WikiLeaks. And WikiLeaks has now gone under and ceased publishing. What I'm worried about is by cutting off the money going to these companies, you, you double the due process risk. Not only do they not necessarily have due process before they get labeled as an infringer and a violator, but they also don't have the means to defend themselves after the fact. They also try to tell ISPs to prevent users from accessing these rogue sites. When people type the website's name, instead of sending them to that site the way the addressing system currently works, we want you to interfere with that and instead send them somewhere else or maybe give them no answer at all. Going after domain names uh, and trying to block domain names is a very blunt instrument. Domain names can be shared among multiple parties. Uh, an easy example is if you think of something like Blogspot. Well, that's a platform for lots of people to blog. Uh, going after the domain name would basically mean that because there were some parties using that domain name to infringe, all the other parties using that domain name get interfered with. The ultimate irony with the use of DNS in these bills is that it won't work. All it does is it destroys the mapping between the name and the address. There are a lot of other ways that you can get that address. Interfering with the addressing system is kind of like delisting its telephone number from the phone book. Uh, anyone who knows the number can still call it and can still talk to the person there. They just can't find it in the phone book anymore. If it were just ineffective, you might say, well, what the heck, let's try it. If it even stops a few people, that's okay, because uh, it's all positive. Uh, unfortunately, it has a bunch of negatives as well. Experts in the field will tell you this creates some significant problems for cybersecurity. The really big worry is that people will get annoyed. People will get annoyed when they can't go to some websites, or they'll be worried that they won't be able to get to some websites that they want to get to. People will decide, I'm not going to go to my ISP's DNS resolver, or I'm going to download this plug in because I don't understand what a DNS resolver is, but somebody else has made it simple for me. Behind the scenes, here's what the plugin is doing. Instead of relying on their ISP to do that address translation, they're relying on some offshore DNS service. At any point though, they could decide, you know, not only do we want to route our users to infringement sites, uh, what if we occasionally take some of them and route them to fake banking sites and try to get their ID information? So if users in the United States en masse start switching to foreign provided DNS services so that they don't have to worry about what this bill may or may not do to their legitimate activity, then we have a real problem. We will tell search engines to no longer provide search results for those sites. A court order would be sent to a search engine to say, you're not supposed to return any search results that take people to this site. So essentially, take it out of your web index. It sets a really dangerous example internationally. It's basically the US embracing the idea that when there are foreign websites that contain content that would violate a domestic law, it's okay to try to block access. We have to think about what if another country did that? What if another country looked at how search engines worked or how the internet architecture worked? And what if they passed laws that changed that to reflect their domestic laws? Some repressive regimes already embrace this technique. We're the ones who are out there telling countries we should just have a single global internet. Don't try to be doing a country by country balkanization. Don't have your country's own blacklist or firewall. When other countries start re-engineering the internet to filter out 
speeches against the governing powers in those countries or religious expression in other countries, that's something that we condemn. It will greatly undermine our ability to be that global voice in favor of a single internet. And I think we shouldn't be surprised if other countries follow our example. I think that China would say, hey, you're taking the Pirate Bay out of search engines. Why can't we take Tiananmen Square out of ours? We shouldn't be surprised when other countries turn around and say, don't tell us we shouldn't do it. It's a domestic law on our books and someone's violating it. So we're gonna have a blacklist of websites. The definition of sites that are subject to Department of Justice suits is entirely open-ended. Essentially just carte blanche for the Department of Justice to go after any user-generated content site. Bad intent isn't even required there. It's just if they're occasionally used for infringing purposes by some of their users, even though they don't want that, they have a policy against it, they take down stuff when they're notified about it, still, under the terms of the law, they could be pursued by the Department of Justice. There's certainly a risk in these bills that innovative new services that are getting started are gonna have trouble with new litigation risks. It gives the rights holders a big club that they can use to potentially threaten new entrants. They have a waiver of all liability should they voluntarily choose to cut off some site. So they can see a site, say, we think this is an infringer. We're just gonna go ahead and cut it off right now. We're gonna go ahead right now and redirect its domain name, not let anybody send any money to it, not let it get any advertising revenue. So the websites are gonna to have to defend themselves and hire lawyers to try to show that in fact, even if there's, even if some users upload infringing content, in fact, they have lots of legal stuff too. Not only does it mean that they need to have some lawyers at hand should something happen, it also means that some people won't bother to get in the business at all because of the chilling effect of possible lawsuit against them. If you look at the history of the response of some of the rights holders to technologies over time, they're not good judges of what new technologies are promising and are worth pursuing. Just a few well-known examples are the VCR, which they're the, the initial instinct of the movie industry was to sue to try to prevent the VCR. Uh, similarly, the first MP3 player was viewed as a big threat by the music industry. When the ISPs, the ad network providers, the financial service providers like PayPal, have the freedom to proactively cut people off, Who's to say that they're doing that because they really believe that this is an infringer? You don't want them having any kind of veto power over new emerging technologies. Maybe what's even more worrisome is the collaboration potential that this introduces. Why would an IP holder bother to go to a court to get an order to force an ISP or PayPal to cut off a site? Why wouldn't they just put in a call to them and say, hey, we think these guys are bad. Do you want to go ahead and cut them off so they don't have to bother going to the courts? And their friends on the other end of the line are going to say, sure, we owe you one. I mean, could it, could it even be the same company? Could uh, Comcast find NBCU content and then cut it off to its ISP users? Yeah, Comcast could just say, I see a site that has some NBC content on it. I'm just going to redirect their name in my domain name system, knowing that the immunity waiver in this bill protects me for anything that I do that is, in my opinion, dedicated to dealing with infringing activity. Making a private company its own judge and jury. That's right. That's private police power in a nutshell with a, here's a waiver from the government so that nobody can sue you for doing this even if you screwed up. The power of the content and communications distributors industry in the FCC and in Congress is tremendous. It's tremendous. They're very savvy players of the Washington game, uh, and they also have a very simple and appealing message that, that, that Congress can easily understand, which is essentially, hey, there's a lot of theft going on on the internet, surely we've got to do something to stop it. If you just look at the lobbying that's going on for these bills right now, you're not seeing the whole picture. I would love to be coming in here and telling you, and Mr. Smith goes to Washington Tale, that the voice of the people really matters and really makes a difference in the city, and sometimes that's true. But when you're talking about media issues, when you're talking about copyright issues, the weight of influence that these companies have is so great. We're talking about a really, really major issue here that has seen extremely little coverage on any form of televised or major media uh, outlet. And this is, this is the problem that we've been working on for a decade. When you only have a few 
major voices controlling the media and controlling the message that gets spread to the American people, you don't get to hear from the people. It's not really a compromise bill. It's actually quite similar to SOPA. Both bills have a number of the same flaws. Congress may well move forward with legislation here, and the only way the damaging parts of the legislation will be removed is if there is enough of a grassroots uproar that Congress gets the message. You don't have to know how the technical architecture works to know that you use it, you rely on it every day, and it works for you. Don't mess with it. The internet isn't broken. It, in fact, it's pretty great. It's been a pretty great forum in the United States and abroad for free expression, for economic innovation, for cultural communication, for everything else that we want the internet to be. We want to keep it that way.